Gracious Father, we thank you that you have called us to your house this morning. And you promised to hear our prayers, to bless us with forgiveness, and give us strength to serve you faithfully this week. Be with us in our worship, we pray, in the name of Jesus. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Our help is in the name of the Lord, who made heaven and earth. I said, if you, O Lord, ever kept your record of our sins, O Lord, who of us could stand? But with thee there is forgiveness, therefore you are here. Since we are gathered this day to hear God's word, call on him in our prayers and praise, and receive the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ in the fellowship of this altar. Let us first consider our unworthiness, and then confess before God and one another that we've sinned in our thoughts, words, and deeds, and that we cannot free ourselves from our sinful condition. Together as his people, let us take refuge in the infinite mercy of God, our Heavenly Father, seeking his grace for the sake of Christ and saying, God be merciful to me, a sinner. Almighty God, have mercy upon us, forgive us our sins, and lead us to our lives tonight. Amen. Almighty God, whose great mercy has given his Son to die for us, for his sake he forgives us all of our sins. As a called and ordained servant of Christ, and by his authority, I forgive you your sins. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. The Old Testament reading for the second Sunday in Lent is from Genesis chapter 17. When Abram was 99 years old, the Lord appeared to Abram and said to him, I am God Almighty. Walk before me and be blameless, that I may make my covenant between me and you and may multiply you greatly. Then Abram fell on his face and God said to him, Behold, my covenant is with you, and you shall be the father of a multitude of nations. No longer shall your name be called Abram, but your name shall be called Abraham. For I have made you a father of a multitude of nations. I will make you exceedingly fruitful, and I will make you into nations, and kings shall come from you. And I will establish my covenant between me and you and your offspring after you, throughout their generations for an everlasting covenant to be God to you and to your offspring after you. And God said to Abraham, As for Sarai, your wife, you shall not call her name Sarai, but Sarah shall be her name. I will bless her, and moreover, I will give you a son by her. I will bless her, and she shall become nations. Kings of peoples shall come from her. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The second lesson is found in the Epistle of Romans, chapter 5. Therefore, since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Through him we have also obtained access by faith into his grace in which we stand, and we rejoice in hope of the glory of God. Not only that, but we rejoice in our sufferings, knowing that suffering produces endurance, and endurance produces character, and character produces hope. And hope does not put us to shame because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. For while we were still weak, at the right time Christ died for the ungodly. 
for one will scarcely die for a righteous person, though perhaps for a good person one would dare even to die. But God shows his love for us in that while we were still sinners, God, Christ died for us. Since therefore we have now been justified by his blood, much more shall we be saved by him from the wrath of God. For while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son. Much more, now that we are reconciled, shall we be saved by his life. More than that, we also rejoice in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received reconciliation. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. gospel for this the second Sunday of Lent is recorded by St. Mark in the eighth chapter. <coughs> Glory be to you, O Lord. And Jesus went on with his disciples to the villages of Caesarea Philippi. And on the way he asked his disciples, who do people say I am? And they told him, John the Baptist, and others say Elijah, and others one of the prophets. And he asked them, But who do you say I am? Peter answered, You are the Christ. And he strictly charged them to tell no one about him. And he began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders and the chief priests and the scribes and be killed and after three days rise again. And he said this plainly, and Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. But turning and seeing his disciples, he rebuked Peter and said, Get behind me, Satan, for you are not setting your mind on the things of God, but on the things of man. And he called to him the crowd with his disciples and said to them, If anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever would save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake and the Gospels will save it. For what does it profit a man to gain the whole world and forfeit his life? For what can a man give in return for his life? For whoever is ashamed of me and of my words in this adulterous and sinful generation of him will the Son of Man also be ashamed when he comes in the glory of his Father with the holy angels. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, o Christ. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under the conscious Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The, the third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. From that he will come to judge us for the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Invite the children up. Jesus had asked the disciples, who do people say that I am? Now could you imagine 
him asking the disciples that question. And what did the people say that he was, who he was? First of all, they said, we think that he's John the Baptist. Well, how could he be John the Baptist? You know what happened to John? He got his head chopped off, right? Okay, they said, well, I think he, they, they say that he's Elijah. How could he be Elijah? Elijah lived like six, seven hundred years ago, right? Or they said, oh, maybe he's one of the prophets. Well, the last prophet that came along, he was in the Old Testament. And that was 400 years ago. So how could he be any of those people? Okay? I think what happened was that people just couldn't see Jesus for who he was. Okay? Because Jesus didn't float down out of heaven and say, look at me, I'm the creator of the universe. You guys should really believe in me. Is, is that the way he came on the earth? No. No, he was, what, a baby in a manger. He was very humble. He came just like you and me. And so I think that was why people were, couldn't see who he was. And But the disciples, when Jesus said, well, who do you say that I am? Who did he, who'd they say then? You are Jesus the Christ, the Messiah, the Holy One. They knew who he was. And you know, shortly after that, he took uh, Peter, James, and John up on the mountain and he transfigured and he said, well, here, I'll show you who I really am, but I don't want everybody to see that right now. I just want a few of you to see that. So he didn't want to become too famous too soon because you know what happens to famous people? Well, everybody wants to be around them and all that kind of stuff. And, you know, if Michael Jackson were to go to the grocery store, what would happen? Everybody would show up, oh, I want your autograph, I want you, I want to see you, I want to touch you, I want to, you know. And so Jesus thought, he was just playing it cool. Because you know what, he didn't want to be made king, not yet. He's going to be coming back as king, king of kings and lord of lords, but at that time, he was humble. You know where he was going? It was about two and a half years into his ministry, and he was going to Jerusalem. Shortly after that, a few months later, he's going to be on the cross. So, he wanted to keep a low profile. He wanted people just to believe in who he was as the Messiah. Okay, so I'll pray and then you guys pray back. Someday he's going to come back in his full glory and everybody's going to see him as he really is. Okay, let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you, Lord, that you came in humility as a man. But someday... You'll come back as Lord of Lords and King of Kings in your full glory. In the name of Christ, amen. So we have a wonderful Messiah. Someday he will return and come back. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. In one of Luther's most famous treatises, he wrote, it's not enough for us to recognize God in his glory and majesty. That is, it's not enough for us to see Jesus sitting on his throne with all the angels gathered around and worshiping him, and with all the saints praising him for his goodness. Great as that glory and majesty that he has is, Luther says, it's not enough for us. What we need to see is Jesus in his humility and in the shape of the cross. For this reason, says Luther, all theology is centered in the cross of the crucified Christ. St. Mark wrote of the crucified Christ in the Gospel read, Jesus began to call his disciples together and he told them the Son of Man must suffer many things. He must be rejected by the elders and chief priests and scribes. He must be killed and on the third day he will rise again. Those words were so upsetting to the disciples as they are to us that Peter took Jesus aside and began to rebuke him. Never, Lord, I'm not going to let this happen to you, Peter said. 
And Jesus looked at Peter and said those shocking words, Get behind me, Satan. You are not thinking the things of God, but the things of man. Jesus was not the kind of Christ most people in the first century were looking for. You recall from the children's sermon, Jesus called the disciples to himself and said, Who do the people say I am? And one of the disciples said, You're a great prophet. And we think of the prophets of the Old Testament. They were wonderful. You're a great teacher. And no one was able to teach like Jesus. You're a powerful miracle worker. And the people were amazed that he could even raise the dead to life. Certainly the people thought, Jesus is the one we want, who's going to reestablish our prestige and make us rich and famous again, just like in the days of David and Solomon. But Jesus disappointed the people. He said, my kingdom is not in the ways of this world. This is not the reason for which I have come. Well, Jesus is not the kind of Christ most people today are looking for either. And sometimes that also includes you and me. The thought of suffering, crucifixion, punishment, those things are upsetting. We don't even like to talk about them or think about them. And I think that I know the reason why. Because when we think about Jesus' suffering and death, we have to admit he suffered and died for me. I deserve to be there, not he. We're also frustrated with the world in which we live. We want there to be peace and contentment, but wars rage. The economy is in an uproar. Our own health is fragile. As much as we would like life to be easy, it isn't. So people don't want to talk about Jesus on the cross. They'd rather talk about something easy. But Jesus said, that's not why I came. After Jesus heard the crowds, Jesus turned to the disciples and said, who do you say I am? And that's when Peter made the great confession, you are the Christ. He is the Christ. What does that mean? You and I know that had he wanted, he could have come down from the cross and inflicted some real discipline on the people who had crucified him. If that's what he wanted to do, he could have. But that's not what he chose to do. He chose to stay at the cross and suffer in full for all your sins and for all my sins and for all the world. He chose to stay on the cross and provide forgiveness, the greatest gift we need. He chose to stay at the cross and provide eternal life for all who believe in him. One of my favorite verses in scripture is from Hebrews, where the writer says, for the joy that was set before him, he endured the cross. He scorned its shame. And now he sits at the right hand of God. What could the joy that caused him to stay at the cross and suffer possibly be? It's the joy of having you and having me and all who believe in him to be his family. Jesus endured the cross and scorned the shame because he loves loving us. He wants to be with us and forgive us and give, grant us mercy. St. Paul writes, in Christ we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our sins according to the riches of his grace. Paul exalts in the epistle over the riches of his grace. He says, we have been justified by faith. We have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. 
Through him we have gained access to the Father. We rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. In Christ, you have the gift of faith. You have the gift of peace. You have the gift of access. You and I have hope. How do we get these riches of God? They come to us every Sunday in the preaching of His Word. They're there in the waters of baptism, as we saw last Sunday. They are distributed at the altar under bread and wine, the very body and blood of Jesus. They are spoken by the pastor. The Lord bless you and give you peace. In word and sacrament, Jesus Christ comes to us humbly, giving us the gifts of God's grace so that we might be saved. Faith comes from hearing the message. The message is heard by the word of God. All of us who were baptized into Christ, who were baptized into his death and resurrection, take, eat, this is my body given for you. This is my blood shed for you. Peace be with you. If you forgive anyone's sins, they are forgiven. Our Lord comes to us as he does humbly because he knows us. He was born one of us in Bethlehem's manger. He truly is God with us in that little child that we worship at Christmas. He understands the life we live. He was tempted in every way that you are. There's nothing new under the sun. He patiently forbears us. He knows we're like wandering sheep that wander every day, one way or another, and get ourselves into a whole host of troubles. He experienced the sad truth that we're not going to be here long. He stood at the grave of Lazarus and cried over what sin had brought into the world. That is why Jesus comes to us as he does, humbly, as our brother, as our best friend, to lift us up and care for us by giving his life on the cross for our sins. St. Paul summarized, for while we were weak, at the right time, Christ died for the ungodly. For very scarcely will one die for a righteous person, though perhaps for a good person one would think about dying. But Christ demonstrated his love for us in this. While we were yet in our sins, Christ died for us. He did die for us. And he also rose for us. And as his risen, as his people, we have the gifts of his grace. Our sins, they're forgiven and forgotten. Our guilt, it's nailed to the cross and we bear it no more. Our death, it has been changed into the most wonderful gate to everlasting life. And someday we will see Jesus in his glory until the time we see him at the cross. Jesus wants us to be his faithful people. All he has invested in us is for our good and is to be used. And he warns us very clearly, whoever would save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will keep it. By grace you are saved through faith it is the gift of God, not of your doing lest anyone should boast. But we are his workmanship. We have been created in Christ Jesus to live a life of good works that he, is, that he has prepared for us beforehand, that we should walk in them. Jesus was completely serious about walking the road the Father had laid out for him. We in our day must be 
completely serious about following Jesus and doing that which honors Him. He has already taken away anything that could hinder us. He's forgiven us our sins. He's taken away our guilt. He's taken away our fear. He's given us a victorious life in which it is our privilege to serve Him with joy. I think that's something we need to bow our heads and pray about. Lord Jesus, it's humbling to think about the fact that you had to go to the cross because of us. We are the ones who sinned, you did not. We were the ones who deserved to die, you did not. But out of love for us, you endured all things. For the joy of having to us as your brothers and sisters for eternity. Grant us the Holy Spirit to think about that daily. So that as we live our life, we will think about the good works that you want us to be doing while we have the time to do them. So that your name may be honored by us all. Bless us, we pray, every day with your spirit. Amen.
please rise for the prayer of the church. Let us pray for the whole church of God in Christ Jesus and for all people according to their needs. Heavenly Father, give us your Holy Spirit that we might deny ourselves, take up the crosses you give, and follow your Son through this troubled life into heaven. Prepare us to give up our lives knowing that Christ has already saved them. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. O Lord, give the church and all her servants grace to fulfill the ministries to which you have committed them. Grant each of us the strength to confess Christ boldly before the world. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Heavenly Father, teach us to shun neither our Lord's suffering nor our own. When we endure persecution or ridicule for being your children, give us faith and perseverance. As you have promised, deliver us out of the hand of the wicked and redeem us from the grasp of the ruthless. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. O God, Abraham was only one when you called him, but you blessed and multiplied him. Protect mothers with child and equip fathers to lead and raise their households in your fear and love. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. O Lord, all kingship belongs to you, and you rule over the nations. Bless Joseph, our president, and those who govern, that they may rule wisely and in accordance with your will. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Great physician, heal and restore, especially, Lord, those we remember in our hearts. Give them your holy care and strength to bear their crosses, that they may endure to see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. O Lord, at your table the afflicted eat the body and blood of your Son and are satisfied. Through our afflictions, deepen our hunger for this table, that we may eat and drink and be satisfied by Christ's saving life. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Heavenly Father, receive our praise this day for St. Peter and his confession that Jesus is the Christ. We rejoice that your Son builds his church upon this rock, and that the gates of hell cannot prevail against it. Keep us in this faith all our days, through the same Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Let us now lift up our hearts. We lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give him our thanks and our praise. It is truly good, right, and salutary that we should at all times and at all places give thanks to you, O Lord, Holy Father, Almighty, Everlasting God, for the countless blessings you so freely bestow on us and all creation. Above all, we give you thanks for your boundless love shown to us when you sent your only begotten Son, Jesus Christ, into our flesh and laid on him our sin giving him into death that we might not die eternally. Because he is now risen from the dead and lives and reigns to all eternity, all who believe in him will overcome sin and death and will rise to a new life. Therefore, with the angels and the archangels and with all the company of heaven, we laud and magnify your glorious name, evermore praising you and saying, Jesus Christ. 
Christ, the night he was betrayed, he took the bread. When he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to the disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way also he took the cup after supper. And when he had given thanks, he gave it to them. And he said, Drink from this, all of you. This cup is the New Testament in my blood, shed for the forgiveness of your sins. Do this whenever you drink of it in remembrance of me. May the peace of the Lord be with you always. Amen. strengthen you and keep you steadfast in true faith unto eternal life. Peace be with you. Amen. on you and grant you peace. Amen. Let us now go in peace and love and serve the Lord. Thanks be to God.